This lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about primitive roots. So first of all, um, explain what a primitive root is. So suppose you pick some modulus m, so this is a positive integer, then a primitive root of m is a number a so that um, all elements of um, z over mz times, you remember this group is the numbers um, modulo m that are co-prime to m. Anyway, all elements of this group have to be powers of a. And um, let's see some examples of this, uh, just to get an idea of what's going on. Suppose you take m equals 1, then z over mz, the, the multiplicative group z over mz just has one element, 1, and that's obviously a primitive root. That's kind of trivial. For m equals 2, it's equally trivial. There's just one element. That's a primitive root. m equals 3, there are two elements, and this time we can see that both of them are powers of 2. So let's put the primitive root in this fluorescent pink colour. Um, for m equals 4, um, there are just two elements, and again, there's an obvious primitive root. For m equals 5, we have to stop and think for a, uh, about a second, because there are now four elements, and 4 isn't a primitive root because its square is 1, so the powers of 4 are just 4 and 1. But you can easily check that 2 and 3 are primitive roots. Um, m equals 6, nothing much happens, there are two elements, 1 and 5, and 5 is the primitive root. For m equals 7, things are now getting a little bit more complicated. So there are six elements in this group. And what we want to do is to find an element of order 6, so that it's six, all its powers are these six elements. And 6 won't do because 6 squared is equal to 1, and 1 won't do because its first power is 1. And what about 2? Well, 2 won't do because 2 cubed is equal to 1, and similarly 4 cubed equals 1. However, the elements 3 and 5 work fine. So if you look at the powers of 3, you get 1, 3, 9 is 2, um, then you multiply that by 3 and you get 6, and you multiply that by 3 and you get 4, so you, you, you get all the powers. So what are the primitive roots for m equals 8? Well, the elements of z over mz star are 1, 3, 5, and 7, and we see 1 squared equals 1, 3 squared equals 1, 5 squared equals 1, 7 squared equals 1. So there are no primitive roots. So um, that, um, there may be no primitive roots at all of a number. So this happens for 8. So let's try to go a bit further. For m equals 9, we have 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8. And you can check the primitive roots. And now... Um, 2 and 5. Um, for 10, we get the elements 1, 3, 7, and 9, and 9 squared is 1, so that's not a primitive root, and 3 and 7 are primitive roots. So if we stop and look at this um, collection of data on primitive roots, you can see it's rather hard to see any patterns going on. The primitive roots seem to be some almost random collection of, of numbers. Um, so, um, we, we need to answer the following questions. First of all, which numbers have primitive roots? So, all numbers up to 10 except 8 have primitive roots. And, you know, what's so special about 8 that prevents this from happening? Um, well, um, we also want to do things like find out how many primitive roots there are. And finally, obvious question, wh what use are primitive roots? Well, to see what use they are, let, let's start by just looking at the case m equals 11. So we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 as the elements of z over 11z, uh, the multiplicative group. And which of these are primitive roots? Well, 1 isn't, obviously. Um, um, 10 isn't because its square is 1. And you can see 3, 4, 5, and 9 are not because their fifth power is equal to 1. And we're left with the primitive roots 
2, 6, 7 and 8. Um, and now let's, let, let's suppose a number a is a primitive root of some number m and we're going to take a to be 2 and m to be 11 just to um, show what's going on. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 which are the elements of z modulo 10z and I'm going to write out the elements of z modulo 11z star. So as you know the elements of z modulo 11z are 1, 2, 4, 8, 5, 10, 9, 7, 3, 6. And why have I written them in this rather funny order? Well, these I'm writing them in the order where these are the numbers 2 to the n. So 2 to the 5 is, is um, 32, which is 10 modulo 11 and so on. So we have a map from z modulo 10z to z modulo 11z star taking n to 2 to the n, where, where this 2 uh, uh, is, is a primitive root. And what we notice is that this map is a homomorphism. Well, so what's a homomorphism? Well, a homomorphism is a map that preserves the group structure. So f of a plus b is f of a times f of b. And you have to be a bit careful because the, the group structure here is written additively and the group structure here is written multiplicatively. So preserving the group structure, we have to change a plus to a times. And it's also a bijection. And a homomorphism between groups that's also a bijection is called an isomorphism. And an isomorphism is just a fancy way of saying that two things are really the same. Um, so what do I mean by saying they're really the same? Well, they're sort of really the same as groups, provided you just relabel all the elements. And so we have to relabel the elements by relabeling 8 as 3 and 6 as 9, and we have to relabel the group operation from addition to multiplication. But apart from that, the, 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 these, are, the, these are really the same groups, that, that, that addition in here just corresponds exactly to multiplication here. Um, and what this means is that any group theoretic property of this group can be turned into a group theoretic property of this group. For example, suppose we want to know in this group what are the solutions of x to the 5 equals 1. Well, they're the solutions of 5x equals 0 in this group because 0 corresponds to 1 and fifth powers correspond to multiplication by 5. And the elements with 5x equals 1 are easy to find. They're, they're just the... Um, five multiples of two. And so the elements with x to the five equals one are just the corresponding elements in this group, which makes them um, which makes them easy to find. You see, adding two to something is, is, very, is, is definitely easier than multiplying something by, say, four. So um, the advantage of a primitive root is it turns in some sense, it turns multiplicative problems into additive problems. Um, so, um, next I should explain where the name primitive root comes from. Well, in um, complex analysis, um, we have um, roots of 1 which are solutions to x to the n equals 1. And if you look at, say, the sixth roots of 1, you remember the sixth roots of 1 lie nicely on a circle and form a sort of regular hexagon, so that we have 1 and minus 1, and we have e to the 2 pi i over 6, and e to the 2 times 2 pi i over 6, and so on. And if you work out the orders of these roots, this one has order 1, this one has order 2, these two of order 3 and these two of order 6. And these are called primitive um, sixth roots 
of one. So there are two primitive sixth roots of one and primitive means all other sixth roots of one are powers of them. So if we take the six powers of this one we get all of these things here. And this is exactly what happens in say z over 11z star. Um, um, we have 10 tenth roots of one by Fermat because Fermat's theorem says that all elements of this are actually tenth roots of one and the primitive ones are the um, ones of order 10 so that every tenth root of one is a power of one of these primitive ones and this is exactly the the definition we gave of a primitive root modulo 11. So a, a primitive root modulo a prime and a primitive root of one in the complex numbers are really more or less the same thing. They're, 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 a, they're a nth root of one that has order exactly n. Um, now we get to the following problem which numbers m have primitive roots. So we saw earlier that all numbers up to 11 other than 8 have primitive roots and so let's try and see some properties that numbers with primitive roots have. So suppose if a is a primitive root of m then we get an isomorphism from z modulo phi of m of z to z over mz star which just takes a number n to a to the n. So, so remember phi of m is the order of z over mz uh, star. Oops. Um, and you see this group here has at most two elements of order dividing 2. So if um, th th this is in general true for z over k is z, so if k is even there are two elements of order dividing 2 and if k is odd there's only one which is, is 0. So, so we get either 0 or 0 and k over 2. So if there's a primitive root this is only two, this is only at most two solutions to x squared equals 1. So if there are four elements with x squared equals 1 or at least four elements there's no primitive root. And this will give us a way to check whether numbers have primitive roots or not. It, it, actually it turns out that, that um, conversely, if there are at most two elements with x squared equals 1, then there is a primitive root. That, that, that's a little bit harder to show. Um, we might more or less show it later. So um, let's see how, how this allows us to eliminate some things. Suppose we look at the group z over m n z star with m and n co-prime. Now, now we apply the Chinese remainder theorem and we recall this says that this is really isomorphic to z over mz star times z over nz star. You remember there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements of this group and pairs where you pick an element of this group and an element of this group provided m and n are co-prime of course. And now this has two solutions to x squared equals 1 which are plus or minus 1 if m is greater than or equal to 3. If m is 2 um, then 1 is equal to minus 1 so these two solutions become the same and similarly this has two solutions if n is greater than or equal to 3. So altogether we get um, when I say two solutions this has at least two solutions. This has at least four solutions to x squared equals 1 if m and n are greater than or equal to 3. So if there's a primitive root of a number we can't write it as the product of two co-prime numbers both of which are at least 3. So this, this, this gives us the, the, the following possibilities. 
So the only possibility is for a primitive root, um, a number has to be that will form p to the k for p prime or 2 times p to the k. And we're allowed 2 here because you remember m and n had to be at least 3, which means we can allow a factor of 2 that is co-prime to that. Because So these are the only numbers that can't be written like that. So the question is, can all numbers of this form be given primitive roots? And the answer is no. There's still one other obstruction. Because if you look at 2 to the k for k greater than or equal to 3, this is four solutions to x squared equals 1. And two of these solutions are obvious. They're 1 and minus 1. And the other two solutions are 2 to the k over 2 and minus 2 to the k over 2. So, um, so the only numbers which... So, so if m has a primitive root then m is equal to one of the numbers 1, 2, 4, or p to the k for p odd, k greater than or equal to 1, or 2p to the k for p odd and greater than or equal to 1. And in fact, all these numbers turn out to have um, primitive roots. Well, how do we show this? Well, um, the first step is to do the case when k equals 1. So we now have the following problem. Does z over pz star have a primitive root? Um, here, of course, p is prime. And um, this was shown by Euler although he actually struggled with it quite a bit. Um, it turns out it's actually rather tricky to show that z over pz star has a primitive root. Um, the, the, the point is, in general, there seems to be no easy way to write down a primitive root of a prime. I mean, you can, you can sort of find one in practice by trial and error without too much difficulty, but the, the, there's no easy way to write down a formula that always gives you a primitive root of a prime. And the proof will be sort of rather indirect. We will show that it has a primitive root by counting up all the elements that aren't primitive roots and showing that there, there are less than p minus 1 of them. Um, anyway, let's start the proof. Um, we need the following key point, which says that a polynomial of degree n um, with coefficients in z modulo pz has at most n roots in z modulo pz. And you may think, well, you already know this. You, I mean, there, 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 there's a theorem in algebra saying that any polynomial of degree n has at most n roots. So what's the big deal about this? Well, the, the point is this is actually false um, mod m if m is not prime. So, for example, We've got this degree 2 polynomial, x squared minus 1, and let's try and solve it in find roots in z modulo 8z. Well, let us four roots. The four roots are 1, 3, 5, and 7. So it is not true in general that a degree n polynomial has at most n roots. However, Euler discovered that this is still true if we work modulo p. And let's try and see why, why, why um, this still works if, if we're working modulo a prime. So suppose we've got some polynomial f of x, which is x to the n plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, and so on, plus a 0. And suppose a is a root. I, I guess I should make, make it clear that a is a, is a variable, not a, not a, not a word. Um, then we can write f of x equals x minus a times x to the n minus 1 plus something or other. Let's call this factor b of x. So this means f of a equals 0. And this argument works perfectly fine 
um, modulo any integer. Um, and we can just copy the usual proof of algebra. You remember you divide this polynomial by x minus a and the, the, the quotient is this and the remainder must be zero because f of a equals zero. So, 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 so this is fine modulo, modulo any number. And now suppose c is a root of f then c minus a times g of c is equal to congruent to 0 mod p. So c minus a is congruent to 0 or gc is congruent to 0. And this is the key step. The reason for this is because p is prime. So let's put a big orange box around this because this is the key point where we use that p is a prime. Um, that's because if p divides c minus a times g of c, it must divide one of these two. That, that's a sort of almost a defining property of prime. So c equals is congruent to a or g of c equals naught. And by induction, there are at most n minus 1 solutions to this equation because the degree of g is n minus 1. So there are at most n roots of f mod um, modulo p. Um, we should point out that this definitely fails if p is not a prime. For instance, suppose we work mod 8 and we look at the polynomial x squared minus 1. Well, this is a root x equals 1, so we can write it as x minus 1 times x plus 1. But now we notice that 3 and 5 are roots of x squared minus 1, but they're not roots of x minus 1 or of x plus 1. So, so this step really does break down. Um, so you can see if we put x equals 3, then this number is 2 and this number is 4, which are both non-zero, but their product is 0 because you can get two non-zero numbers mod 8 whose product is 0. So, so that works fine for primes, but not for, um, but not for arbitrary numbers. Um, now we notice that z modulo pz star has at most n elements of order dividing n. This is for any n. And this follows because these are just the roots of x to the n minus 1 is congruent to 0 modulo p. And we just showed that a polynomial has at most n roots. And now we notice that z over pz star has at most phi of n elements of order exactly n. So here we're looking at the order dividing n. Here we're looking at the order being exactly n. So suppose there is at least one element of order n. So suppose a has order n. And if there isn't one element, then there are certainly less than phi of n because there are none of them. Then we find 1 a a squared up to a to the n minus 1 are all of order n. Sorry, all of order dividing n. And so there are n of these, and there are most n elements of order dividing n. So these are all elements of order dividing n. Um, in particular, all elements of order n uh, occur among these. And we notice that ai has order n if and only if i is co-prime to n. If i isn't co-prime to n, then you can easily see that, that a to the i has order, order less than n. So um, order is n um, is equivalent to saying that i is in z um, so, sorry, that, that, that i is co-prime to n, so the number of elements of order n is just phi of n.
because this is the number of numbers co prime to n. So we see that in, in fact we can say that, that z over pz star has either five n elements of order exactly n or it has none at all. So we can now do some counting to show the existence of a primitive root. So first of all, we recall the following formula that the sum of d divides n of 5d is equal to n. Um, now we, we're going to take the special case n equals p minus 1 and we get sum over d divides p minus 1 of 5d is equal to p minus 1. On the other hand, let's count the number of elements in the group. So we know the sum of d divides p minus 1 of the number of elements of order d is also equal to p minus 1 because this is every element of z over p minus 1 z has some order d which must divide p minus 1 by Fermat's theorem and this is just the order of z over p z star, um, every element of order, so that should be z over p z star. It's isomorphic to the first group but don't want to confuse them. Um, now um, we notice that these two sums are the same but if we look at this um, term here and this term here we notice that this term here is less than or equal to this term here because we, we just proved it on the previous sheet. Now if two sums are equal and every term in one sum is less than or equal to every term in the other sum, all the terms must in fact be equal. So we say in fact equal as the sums are the same. So um, z over pz times has exactly phi of d elements of order d whenever d divides p minus 1. So it is phi p minus 1 elements of order um, p minus 1. And these elements are the primitive roots, so it has primitive roots. And in fact we've, we can now calculate the number of primitive roots modulo p, it's just phi of p minus 1. Um, so let's give an example of this. So, so let's solve the following problem. How many solutions are there to x cubed is congruent to 1 modulo 97? And the second problem is what are they? Well, um, problem 1, we want to solve... Um, x cubed is common to 1 mod 97, so we put x equals g to the k, where g is a primitive root. And at the moment we don't care what the primitive root is. So we want to solve g to the 3k is common to 1 mod 97, and this is equivalent to solving 3k is common to 0 mod 97 minus 1 by the isomorphism between z modulo 96 and z modulo 97 star. Now solving 3k is 0 mod 97 minus 1 is really easy. Um, we just see that k is equal to 96 over 3 or 0 or 2 times 96 over 3 which is 0, 32 or 64. So we can see there are three solutions. And we can see there are three solutions with very little calculation. We, we just had to notice, in fact, the only thing we used is that 97 is 1 modulo 3. And, and this works for any prime that's 1 modulo 3. There will always be three solutions to this. Now we have the problem, what are the solutions? Well, for this, um, we should find a primitive root. And the easy way to find them a primitive root is to look them up in my book of primitive roots. So I actually have a book. 
here we have the theory of numbers by Vinogradov and in the back of it he has this nice table, tables of primitive roots. So for every prime he lists a primitive root and he lists the powers of that primitive root and he also lists the inverse of this. So, so here for instance for 37 the, a primitive root is 2 and 2 to the 23 for example is going to be 5. And on the other hand, if you want to know what the power of 5, what, the, what you need to raise 2 to the power of to get, 20, to get 23, sorry, to get 5, you look it up in this table, so you look up 5 and you see the answer is 23. So this is a sort of table of anti-logarithms and this is a table of logarithms. Anyway, let's go to the prime number 97. Let me magnify this a bit so you can actually see it. And you see from this that it says that 5 is a primitive root and here it gives the various powers of 5. And we want 5 to the power of 32 and you see it says here that 5 to the power of 32 is 35 and 5 to the power of 64 is 61. So the solutions are 5 to the 32 equals 35 and 5 to the 64 which is equal to 61, I should say congruent to 61. So in the days before computers, people actually wrote out these tables of primitive roots and used them to do calculations modulo p, and you could use them to solve equations like that and so on. Um, okay, uh, so uh, that settles the problem of primitive roots modulo p, they always exist. In the next lecture we will discuss um, primitive roots modulo powers of p and also relate them to a theorem called Wilson's theorem.